In this video, we will discuss the hemostatic organ involved in regulating blood water level which is the kidney starting with the structure of the nephron and then the processes involved in urine formation Nephron is the functional unit of kidney that can be found inside the medulla of the kidney Each nephron consists of Bowman's capsule proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle, distal convoluted tubule, and collecting duct. The loop of Henle can be divided into two segments. The first one is the descending limb, and the second one is ascending limb of loop of Henle. During urine formation, the flow of fluid inside the nephron will start with Bowman capsule, and then the fluid will flow into the proximal convoluted tubule, followed by going down the descending limb of loop of Henle and then going up the ascending limb of the loop of Henle into the distal converted tubule and finally collected into the collecting duct. Next, there are two main blood vessels associated with the nephron. The first one is vasa recta, the second one is glomerulus. Vasa recta is a hairpin shaped blood vessel that run parallel to the loop of Henle. For glomerulus, it is a loop of capillaries twisted into a ball shaped structure surrounded by the Bowman's capsule. Blood will enter the glomerulus via efferent atriole and exit the glomerulus via the efferent atriole. Notice the difference in the diameter of the efferent and efferent atriole. The difference is very important because it will increase the efficiency of ultrafiltration process during urine formation. Now we will discuss the processes of urine formation. Urine formation involves three main processes. The first one is ultrafiltration followed by reabsorption and secretion. During ultrafiltration, the components of the blood plasma will be removed from the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule to form glomerular filtrate. This involves all components of the blood plasma including water, glucose, urea, nutrients, amino acids, or any other dissolved materials inside the blood plasma. There are a few components that is not removed from the blood plasma which includes all blood cells, platelet, and large plasma proteins. As we can see, this process is very similar to the process of formation of interstitial fluid in the lymphatic system where blood plasma is also removed from the blood capillary into the interstitial space and form interstitial fluid. However, during this process, the components of the blood plasma that is not removed is the red blood cell, platelet, and large plasma protein. This means that white blood cell can still move out of the blood capillary into the interstitial space. For ultrafiltration, all blood cell is not removed from the blood plasma, which includes white blood cell. Why does all blood cells not remove during ultrafiltration? It is because the presence of glomerular filtration barrier. This barrier consists of the podocyte food process or also known as the pedicel, secondly the endothelium wall, and then the basement membrane. Next, we will discuss the factors which increases the efficiency of ultrafiltration. The first factor is high hydrostatic pressure inside the glomerulus. This high hydrostatic pressure is because of the diameter of the efferent atriole is smaller than the afferent atriole. The smaller diameter of the efferent atriole causes blood to become congested in a tight spaces within the glomerular capillaries. Thus increases the hydrostatic pressure within the glomerulus as more and more blood enters the glomerulus via the afferent atriole. The second factor is the highly coiled glomerulus which will provide large surface area 
for blood plasma to diffuse out of the glomerulus. This will allow large quantity of glomerular filtrate to be formed. The next factor is the high permeability of the glomerulus. This is to ensure easier removal of the blood plasma component because the wall of the endothelium is perforated and it is also only one cell thick. The combination of all of these factors will ensure that the process of ultrafiltration will occur at optimum rate. From Bowman's capsule, the glomerular filtrate will flow into the proximal converted tubule where reabsorption and secretion will take place. Reabsorption is the process where substances from the glomerular filtrate will be taken back into the blood capillary. In contrast, during secretion, substances from the blood plasma will be transported into the glomerular filtrate. At proximal convoluted tubule, reabsorption of substances from the glomerular filtrate will involve active and passive transport. Active transport involves molecules such as glucose, amino acids, vitamins, and sodium chloride. While for the passive transport, it will involve movement of water by osmosis, hydrogen carbonate ions, and the potassium ions. At the same time, during reabsorption, secretion will also take place at the proximal convoluted tubule. During secretion at the proximal converted tubule, there will be active transport of hydrogen ions, drugs, and toxin, and passive transport of water and urea from the blood into the glomerular filtrate. Next, from the proximal converted tubule, glomerular filtrate will flow down the descending limb of loop of Henle, where reabsorption of water will occur by passive transport. As we can see in the animation, only water will be removed from the glomerular filtrate at the descending limb of loop of Henle. This is because the wall of descending limb is only permeable to water, but impermeable to sodium chloride. The permeability of the wall is due to the presence of aquaporins, which is a type of channel protein for water molecules. Secondly, the tissue surrounding the loop of Henle has very low water potential due to accumulation of sodium chloride in the tissue. This creates water potential gradient which will cause water to move out of the glomerular filtrate from high water potential to low water potential. Why do the tissue surrounding the loop of Henle has high concentration of sodium chloride? Sodium chloride comes from reabsorption of sodium chloride from the glomerular filtrate at the ascending limb of loop of Henle. The reabsorption of sodium chloride occurs by passive transport at the thin segment of the ascending limb while the active transport takes place at the thick segment of the ascending limb. This shows that at the ascending limb of loop of Henle, reabsorption will only involve sodium chloride and not water. This means that the wall of the ascending limb is only permeable to sodium chloride but not permeable to water. As a result, the surrounding tissue will have low water potential due to accumulation of sodium chloride in the tissue. Next, water and sodium chloride from the tissue will be reabsorbed back into the vasa recta to maintain water potential gradient between the glomerular filtrate and the kidney tissue. At the loop of Henle, there is no secretion process. Glomerular filtrate from the ascending limb of loop Henle next will flow into the distal convoluted tubule, where reabsorption of hydrogen carbonate ion and sodium chloride ion will take place by active transport followed by passive transport of water. At the same time, secretion of hydrogen ions and potassium ions by active transport will also happen at distal convoluted tubule. Finally, the glomerular filtrate will move out of the distal convoluted tubule into the collecting duct. 
where reabsorption of sodium chloride also occur by active transport, while reabsorption of water will occur by passive transport, which is osmosis. At this point, what's left inside the glomerular filtrate will become urine. Urine will be collected inside the urinary bladder and then removed from the body via urethra. In conclusion, the level of water inside the blood can be controlled by controlling the amount of water reabsorbed from the glomerular filtrate. Increasing the reabsorption of water will decrease the amount of urine form. Similarly, decreasing the reabsorption of water from glomerular filtrate will increase the amount of urine.